but he's also he also holds an academic adjunct faculty appointment in the Department of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health in, at the Emory University in Georgia. Um, he obtained his degrees. He had a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, um, his medical degree, and his Master's in Public Health, as well as his ID fellowship training at the University of South Florida College of Medicine and Public Health. Um, his internal medicine residency training was at Orlando Health. You guys know Orlando Health, that's right here. Um, a large nonprofit, not for profit network of community and specialty hospitals affiliated with the University of Florida. In 2010, he completed the fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. And he is a commissioned officer holding the rank of commander in the U.S. Public Health Service and currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia. So please give a hand for Dr. C. Dunn. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, it's good to hold your applause till the person finishes speaking um, because you don't know what you're in store for and you don't want to commit yourself. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to stand over here so that I can be in earshot of that camera that's looking at me and, and also see the screen uh, and, 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 and see all of you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, I, I hope that the time that we spend together will invigorate you uh, and it will move you from wherever you are and whatever way you're thinking about things in a direction that I think is worthwhile going. Um, so those of you who are here are involved in the, the act of being educated, of learning. And hopefully that is linked with your future aspirations, wherever they are, whatever you're going to be doing. And I think this wonderful quote from Abraham Lincoln uh, really tries to uh, put some perspective on how, the fu how you should be in relationship to the future. And I think that when, when he said that the best way to predict your future is to create it, keep that in mind no matter what happens to you in, 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 your, in the course of your journey. So um, the, the topic that I'm going to be discussing is population health. And many of you perhaps have heard because of Donna and, and your other speakers about the term public health. Perhaps many of you have not necessarily heard about population health. But clearly population health is something that we should all be focused on for reasons that will become clear as we discuss this. Um, we're going to talk about health systems and what change means to health systems. And I'm going to introduce you to a concept that, for want, for want of a better term, I, I created. I didn't create the, the, the nuts and bolts of the concept, but uh, labeling it as such, I wanted to make it cryptic enough to kind of tease you into being interested. And, and that's the critical E triangle. And that will become clear in just a few minutes. But it's all about what we can do. So I kind of try to build a case during this discussion, laying out some facts, some perspectives, and then getting you to think about perhaps what you can do. So the first disclaimer that I have is that the findings and conclusions in this presentation are mine. They do not necessarily represent the views of Emory, where I have an adjunct appointment, the CDC, the US Public Health Service, or the, for that matter, the Florida Department of Health. I have a bunch of I messages for you today, all right? I want to inform you, invite you, and inspire you. I'd like to give you first some information and context to expand your awareness and to provide some motivation for extra learning that goes beyond even the course. I want to invite you to reframe your perception about things from what is very admittedly and justifiably a very natural position that we all hold, which is the me, the I position, to the we position. When you flip that channel from the I to the we, there are a lot of magical things that happen. And I'm going to try to make a case why we should all be doing that more and more. And then the last thing is going to be to inspire you, to consider ways to translate your strong intentions that you have into uh, effective action. I asked Donna, you know, where are these people going? And uh, she said that, you know, there's some nursing folks, there's some people who are maybe thinking about medicine, people who are thinking about public health, people who don't know. And so I would wager that no matter what you're wanting to do, 
my guess is that you want to make a difference. How many of you want to make a difference in your field in the future? Good. That is the key ingredient to leadership, is to the desire to want to make that difference. And that's what I think we're going to talk about in many ways. So let's start with the first part, which is to inform. And this is a great quote from Goethe. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. This is the particular quote that, that begins every monograph and document, usually a few hundred pages, each document that the Institute of Medicine puts out. And it's called IOM.org. If you ever want to go to learn about a bunch of things that are happening in the field of healthcare, public health, population health, the society in general, go to the Institute of Medicine, open up any one of their monographs, and you'll see that particular quote. So, no lecture that I give anywhere remotely in, uh, involving this topic would be complete without honoring uh, Rudolf Virchow. How many of you have ever, ever heard of his name, Rudolf Virchow? Okay, so a few of you. He's not necessarily known well in the field of epidemiology per se. He is certainly known very well in the field of medicine and in other areas. But he is really the father of social medicine. He was a brilliant student. He knew many, many languages. He lived in a time when, in the, in the 19th century, when uh, there was so much change and so much of an emphasis on public health. And yet, th we needed people who were going to push the envelope and make, uh, ask tough questions and get governments to kind of think about their policies. And he was very prolific. He wrote somewhere up to a thousand monographs, articles, books, book chapters, letters. I mean, he's an amazingly prolific guy. But in 1847, he did something that was really at the, the, the kind of the pinnacle of his career in many ways, which is that as a young man, and he was, uh, you know, in his, uh, in his 20s, he was asked by the Prussian government to investigate a typhus out outbreak that was going on uh, due to a rickettsial disease. And it was uh, at the time of military conflict. It was in uh, war-torn, poor areas. And they thought that he would go there and try to figure out what the outbreak is due to and then fix it. And he thought the same. So he went over there and he kind of did an investigation and came up with a nice report that was a several hundred pages. And at the end of it, the conclusion was something that he came to through the science. But, you know, the government that commissioned it didn't really like what he had to say. Because what he had to say was that if you want to squash this outbreak, this epidemic, and you want to try to prevent the next one, you've got to change the upstream determinants of health, the social determinants of health that are driving this outbreak. It's not about picking out a pathogen and, and, and squashing it with some antibiotics or at that time some, some means of isolation or, or whatnot. It was about dealing with poverty and, and economics and civil strife and all the things that were too large for any one government to handle. But he said that we should all try to move in that direction because that's the way to prevent this. Well, he learned very quickly that you don't say those kinds of truthful things to the government that wants to put forward a certain position. And they said, he said that, well, I'm going to now be either obligated to stay in public health and deal with this kind of a morass, uh, you know, and, and just marry public health and politics and all of this, or leave, leave the field. And you know what he did for the rest of his life? He, he integrated politics and public health and policy into his work. And um, he, he really, he did some amazing things. So I would recommend that you learn about Virchow and read about him. Now, how many of you know this name, Florence Nightingale? All right, so a few more hands go up, which is nice, because those of you especially who are going into nursing would know and think of Florence Nightingale as the mother of nursing, and I would agree, uh, perhaps uh, you too. Uh, but she was also, in my mind, the mother of hospital epidemiology and infection control. 
she was an incredible student. Uh, that is not something that is uh, uh, talked about much, but she studied Italian and Latin and Greek, the classics. She studied history, and she was a, 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 a vivacious person, uh, personality, and she was very passionately interested in mathematics. And later, when she went to the Crimean War, the, the front, to, um, to deal with the kind of horrific conditions that the soldiers were at the time facing, um, she didn't know what, was gonna, what, what she was stepping into, and no one really knew of her uh, future greatness, but she wound up being a statistician, a data collector. She kept records that were very systematic. She uh, talked about how to display data in certain ways that you could uh, understand and communicate. But she became ultimately the change agent for the military, for healthcare, and in nursing. She set up the entire mechanisms of triage and how to, how to use those principles of infection control that, quite frankly, are being used even in fighting diseases such as Ebola uh, today. So she is, uh, I think, uh, uh, more dear to my heart than Jon Snow, who I know you know because if you take a course in Epi, you always hear about Jon Snow, but you may not hear about uh, Florence Nightingale. All right, so how is health created? We talk about health, health care, public health. Let me posit for you a, a certain perspective that, that, that I have, and this is uh, echoed in an article by Kurt Stank. We first of all, we talk about the person and family. We're all individual citizens. We all get sick. We all are human beings. We're going to have family and friends and others, but ourselves in particular, getting sick and, and needing our health and needing to get back to health. Then, of course, we have the uh, primary health care system. Those of you who have primary care physicians or nurse pr uh, practitioners who you go to in case you're sick. And the overlap of that interaction is uh, resulting in personalized health care. Then you have, of course, the health care system, of which primary care is a part, but if you need a specialist, a procedure, a fancy drug, or a technology, you're going to access this. And hopefully, your primary health care system will be part of this, providing a healing environment to you, whatever affliction you have. And then, of course, you're looking at public health in the community. And the public health and community inter interfacing with both the person and family because we all want healthy environments. And clearly, we, we come to realize very quickly that getting to health is not something that happens within the office clinic setting or the hospital setting. Health begins in the community far outside the walls of the clinic where we work and play and pray and eat and uh, have recreation and, and, and we work. And, and that public health community setting is also going to have to interact with the healthcare system in a way to create organizations that are responsive to the public's need, not having their own agendas for whatever reason. And this, this theme is something I'm going to unpack for you uh, over this next hour. And that intersection of all of that is what generates health. Health being uh, really a word, the etymology of which is holism or holistic, to be whole. So you can't necessarily be cured of something, but you can try to be whole and try to be peaceful in regaining your health. But what's interesting is that there are, there's a core context and there are drivers for health. And this health is actually, I think, at the center of another set of processes that involve, quite frankly, money, people, the environment, nature, government, and values, our human values, our individual values or societal values. And all of that forms the context of the E triangle. The E triangle being the interface between epidemiology, ecology, and economy. And so I would submit that money and governance really drive the economy. The people and their values for what they do, like and don't like drive a lot of the things that we study in epidemiology, and nature and environment are drive, drivers of ecology. And everything that happens, happens in this kind of a, a, in this kind of a context right here in the middle. Okay. Quick little advertisement. I'm not getting sponsorship or paid for this, but this is important. Um, 
Donna has probably, as a good teacher, has exposed you to resources that you can tap into for learning epidemiology um, through this course and even elsewhere. But I always suggest to people that there are lots of online modules and that are free that, that um, are really wonderful. So look into them. Go into the Principles of Epidemiology at CDC the New York, North Carolina Institute for Public Health, the APTR epi courses, the primer on population health, and then of course a bunch of MOOCs, you know, the massive open online courses. And, um, and these are all hyperlinked in the PowerPoint or the, 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 the slides that you'll get. I always like to say out at, at the outset that for those people who are thinking about not necessarily being career epidemiologist in the university setting, but who really want to take it, take epidemiology and go to the next level, whether it's in nursing or clinical fields or medicine or whatnot, we kind of want to think about what's the purpose of epidemiology in public health practice. And there are four things here. One is that epidemiology helps you to discover the agent, the host, the environment, that kind of critical triad uh, around factors that affect health. But it also, as a scientific discipline, helps you to determine the relative importance of disease when it occurs in populations, illness, disability, and, and death. It also helps you to identify those sections of the population that have greater risk from various factors than others. And so there is that differential factor of what segments are affected, which ones are impacted negatively or positively, and that's a really important feature. And ultimately, Epidemiology hopefully allows you to evaluate the effectiveness of health programs and services that are purported to improve population health. And if you think about this list, which is from the MMWR, uh, it's a list. There could be many things added to this. But these are the 10 great public health achievements in the last decade or the first decade of, of the 21st century. And as you see here, they cross the gamut of both infectious disease, preparedness, chronic disease, environmental health. And guess what? Epidemiology as the core science of public health is at the root of every one of these accomplishments. You can't have sound policy and sound science and sound public health practice without being able to understand how diseases are distributed in populations, what determines those diseases, and what kind of intermediary factors there are that, um, that, that play a part. And so all of these are, are really based on epidemiology. So let's unpack this particular triangle of epi, ecology, and economy. All right? So the first thing that I'd like to do is to talk about the US health system right here, population health and equity. I'm going to also talk about the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, public health and primary care. I'm going to talk a little bit about this next area, which is community health, consumerism, and corporations. And, um, and you might wonder, why is he talking about that? Well, I'm going to try to build a case for why we ought to perhaps think about this and be interested in this area. And then finally, the last two, which are kind of complex together, are global risks and climate change and the emerging infections that we're seeing, including, of course, hot topics, Ebola, neglected tropical disease, and whatnot. Now, this is an ambitious agenda in the course of an hour, but the purpose is to, is to kind of at once skim the surface but do it in a way that helps you get motivated to dive deep and learn about the various things that are, that are being talked about. And there's resources for that as well. And we'll, I'm sure, have some time for Q&A uh, as we move uh, forward. OK. So um, the most important thing out of this triangle is after we get through that information and invitation and an inspirational piece, I'd like to suggest that there are things that we can really all do individually and collectively as actionable items for change in this triangle, which may seem very rigid at times, but there's stuff that we can do. So let's talk about the US health system, population health, and equity just a little bit. So Alma Ata, uh, how many of you have heard of Alma Ata? So it's not the name of a person, it's a geographic location. And um, in 1978, the World Health Organization and the, uh, and the United Nations in part um, basically crafted and uh, a, a, they convened a meeting of 150 nations, uh, including the United States, to get together and answer 
an apparently simple question, which is that if you want a strong national health system in your country to take care of the people in your country, what should be the pillar? What should be the basis of that? And they found out through this whole discussion that a primary health care system would be the backbone and the skeleton of any sort of great public health or national health system. The ability for people wherever they live, regardless of what their ability to pay is, to access a set of health care providers and public health entities in order to restore their health from disease, to maintain their health if they have it, to protect their health from, from onslaughts, and to promote their health in various ways. And the goal of this health system would be such that we are having it universally accessible for all. Now, you'd think that this is where the conversation began, and many, many countries responded quite favorably to uh, the question. But there were some countries, unfortunately, that opted to take a little bit of a different stance. And let me explain to you what I mean when I talk about the healthcare decommodification. So the United States is unfortunately having a pretty low index on a decommodification index. And, and let me tell you what this is about and, and, and where we went from Alma Ata. So Alma Ata asked this question about primary health care, and many countries said, you know, absolutely right. Health care is a human right, and it should be available for all people. Whether you are in a, in a, in a governance or an economic system that promotes entrepreneurship or, or, or capitalist uh, framework, or you are in another type of uh, a framework, whatever it is, the principle that everyone should be having access to uh, universal health care, et cetera, that's, that's a human right. Well, there are some countries who said, you know, that sounds really great. I think it's a really neat thing to say. But you know, at the end of the day, that's not how human motivation works. Human motivation works in terms of markets and e e economics of markets. So we're going to let markets, your access to markets and your access to pay, uh, and to spend as a consumer, we're going to let that be the guiding light which will help regulate health care, its distribution, its access. We're going to let markets really handle this. Well, there were some countries who, which said that, and unfortunately, they didn't know, but they were plummeting on the decommodification index, which is an index that, uh, that Bambra, a social scientist, came up with to suggest that, well, maybe we, in fact, should try to look at how strong, how strongly does a system uh, exist to couple or uncouple healthcare access to markets? And they were saying that, in fact, if you have an uncoupled situation where someone's access to financial resources doesn't really determine whether they can get healthcare or not, which you would think is, is a fundamental human right, well, those, situ situ those uh, are going to have a fairly high index. Um, and unfortunately, those countries that, that opted to take a different stance have uh, gone down in this decommodification index. And so they have coupled access to markets with access to health. Now you'd think, well, what's wrong with that? Let me suggest a few things. This is what is partly wrong with that. The US health and international perspective, shorter lives and poor health, was an extraordinarily sobering 200 plus page document that was published last year, and I recommend you reading it. Um, and it basically spells out that with re relatively a comparison of about another 20 countries that are economically very much like ours, powerhouses, you know, OECD nations, I mean, uh, countries that are not necessarily developing, but really developed and industrialized, they are doing far better when it comes to population health. And this cartoon kind of tells us where we are with all of the, wh what we're doing. We unfortunately are losing a lot of uh, adjusted years of life to alcohol and drugs. We have the highest prevalence of diabetes in certain age groups. We have uh, the second uh, highest rate of heart disease. We have the higher prevalence of chronic lung disease than Europe and the UK. We have issues with teenage uh, STDs and adolescent pregnancies. We have an aging population. There's 10,000 people that turn 65 every day in this country. 
and that's a relentless graying of America that's happening and it's diversifying and arthritis and activity and disabling conditions are there and of course now we've surpassed other countries including Mexico as the highest rate of obesity. We have of course uh, huge extant problems with HIV and AIDS and as you can tell based on the news and all of the tragic events we have major league problems with violence injuries and car accidents. This is in part due to the fact that health disparities and health inequalities are part of the package and of course social mobility and, and your role and your stratification in society is a large function of income. And it turns out that we in fact have great disparities in access to care. The percent of access for example measures for which each group here was experiencing worse, same or better. You can see that in all of these different ethnic groups and including economic uh, uh, minorities if you will that you, you look at uh, of, you know, worse access or same access to care. A preponderance of the majority here, this, this, this large groups uh, in all of these have um, either the same or worse access to care and that whole access to care is linked with markets and ability to be able to mobilize. That's why in fact we have, you know, we had 47 million people who were underinsured and uninsured in this country. We have less, but because of other issues that are going on politically and, and, and economically, we clearly have not met the mandate of what the Affordable Care Act would aspire to uh, still. So it turns out that population health is is really related to how long you live and the quality of your life. Well, those health outcomes are driven by policies and programs through mediated through a bunch of health factors. And these are the big buckets, if you will, of health factors. Health behaviors, personal choices, clinical care, our clinical care and hospital uh, health care system, our socioeconomic factors and physical environment. And I want you to notice something. We talk about public health and health care as the being, you know, health care as being the big game in town. Well, it turns out that the science actually suggests that it explains only 20% of the variability, if you will, in population health outcomes. Most of it, socioeconomic factors, the built environment, and personal choice makes up the other 80%. And in fact, 50% is just on those upstream determinants of care, of, of health, that Virchow isolated as and identified as the main, major things. So the health system focus is on population health. And the IOM <coughs> came up with a model that suggested that governmental public health infrastructure, since we don't have a Ministry of Health, we have a de Department of Health and Human Services, but that government public health, federal, state, national, local, regional, governmental public health, uh, that that can form the basis <coughs> in the states and in the country to determine how effectively all the different conveners in the community can come together around health. So you have the clinical care delivery system, you have the community, you have employers and businesses, you have other governmental agencies such as Department of Ag, Transportation, Urban Planning, all of which have a hand in health. And then of course the education sector and the media. Well governmental public health they said is the centerpiece of our health system. Makes sense. What doesn't make sense is what I'm about to show you. This doesn't make sense. Out of the $2.8 trillion that we spend in this country in terms of national health expenditures, 3%, a whopping 3% is allocated to governmental public health, which I just told you is the centerpiece of our health system at large, or ought to be. 75% of the expenditures are for the 5% or less of people who are getting sick with tertiary diseases and care in the hospital setting, largely 80% of which are completely preventable. So we are not necessarily putting where our money, where our mouth is. We're not focused on prevent preventing diseases. We're certainly not as well off in terms of dealing with the social economic determinants of health, which ultimately drive that. But we are, in fact, valuing big technology, big drugs, big financing, big insurance. You know, that's what we're kind of valuing, because that's where 75% of our $2.8 trillion is going. And by the way, $2.8 trillion, that's a lot of money. 
It's worse than that because we are spending more as a percent of our, our, our GDP, our gross domestic product, than any other country in the world. We're spending 17 to 18%, and that is on a slope like this. The only way we're going to bend the cost curve, really, and not shift it, is to get healthier as a, as a country. Because if you get healthy, you won't access all this stuff. So let's talk about what we're trying to do to get us healthy. So this is a great article. And this was the phys you know, the, uh, 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 Public Health Science Research Article of the Year. This was it, entitled, How Effective Are Public Health Departments at Preventing Mortality? And then in a nutshell, let me tell you what these people did. They did a cost uh, effective analysis. And they, and they looked at California as a state. And they asked the question that if we, in fact, if California extends its per capita public health expenditure by $10, $10 per capita, what kind of an impact in mortality is that going to make? And they found that for an extra $10 per capita health care expenditure, they could save 9.1 per 100,000 lives. Now, what does that mean? For the budget that California Department of Health has, that translates to 27,000 lives saved just because of the public health departments that are operating in that state. And if you look at the actuarial cost of what a life is worth in terms of its statistics, it's about $7.9 million. So that 27,000 lives translates to $212.8 billion that the health departments in, in one state are saving, apart from the lives that they're saving, that's the money that they're saving. That's an unbelievable statistic. And that's just one state. Think of that being replicated across the country, right? In all of the different public health departments. And that's why people who are in public health, Donna, myself, and many others, are always going, over here, over here. <laughs> we need the resources, we need the support, because we're making a difference. And how is health making a difference? Well, health is now being introduced in all policies. And for the first time, under the larger umbrella of the Affordable Care Act, we actually have a National Prevention Council and a National Prevention Strategy, the pillars of which are to focus on health and safe community environments, clinical and community preventive services, elimination of health inequalities, which is mainly driven by income inequality, which is a major, major problem in this country. We have a larger divide between in our, in our income inequality from the, quote, the haves and the have-nots than any other time in any other country. I mean, it's, it's staggering to look at the statistics on this. And of, and of course, empowering people. Now. That brings us to this next phase, which is community health and the other things. So let me invite you to that second phase now, invite you uh, to, to something that Al Gore uh, was quoted as saying. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. We have to go far and we have to go quickly. And that means that we have to quickly find a way to change the world's consciousness about exactly what we're facing and why we have to work to solve it. This is a wonderful book. I would recommend highly that you buy and read this little paperback book called The Future Public Health. And Hanlon and his colleagues have taken on the task, which is, I think, a very laudable and challenging one, which is they're trying to actually define where is public health writ at large going, not just in the UK, but in the world. Where is it going? And, and I can't unpack this in our short time, but suffice it to say that there are four waves of public health that they describe. Starting from the time of Virchow, these were periods of time, which 20 to 30 to 40 years, in which major accomplishments were done. Sanitary hygiene theory, and access to new medications, and technologies, and vaccines, and clinical health care, you know, public health interface, and all that. But now he's saying that there's a fifth wave. And the fifth wave is where public health is going. And that's where all of you, hopefully, will find great career paths, which is all about the culture for health. We need to have a culture of health, not just treating diseases and saying that the absence of those is, means that you have health. 
it doesn't mean that you get siloed into one thing or another, but that we all are part of a community at a local, national, state, regional, uh, global level in which we have a culture of health. And that's where this, this is being driven. And in fact, they make the point that there's a developmental intelligence that we should go from being a self-centric anything, which is very understandable. We have to take care of ourselves. Maslow taught us that, right? We have to take care of ourselves. But we, once we get to a higher frame in our self-actualization up the pyramid, and we have our basic needs met, then we can start thinking about the we. That means we belong to certain groups and tribes and nations and communities. And so we th become ethnocentric. But you know, it doesn't stop there. Because if there's anything that, that even a staggering catastrophe like Ebola is teaching us, it's that we are really, it's, we're all in this together. We really are. And when we start talking about the next topic I'm going to discuss, climate change, we're really in it together. So this all of us focus has, is about the ability to take into account multiple perspectives. And really that's what we talk about as the anthropological perspective to public health. And that's why anthropology, I think, should be a bedrock science in medicine and in public health. And it will with time. Trust me, it will. So what does population health management look like? So when we marry the Affordable Care Act, which is about changing our insurance system and, and health insurance and bringing those health care uh, uh, partners to the table as in, in terms of our community, w this schema really is a nice way to depict this. If we have a certain community, let's say a neighborhood or a, or a city or a township, and we have a population, we have different groups. We have, we have these PCMHs, which are called the patient-centered medical homes, and we'll uh, talk about that in a second, but we have public health entities, we have hospitals, we have rehab clinics, we have nursing homes and visiting ambulatory care settings, we have pharmacies, and we have all of these entities. But they're all siloed, they're not necessarily talking with each other, they're not, they're sh they're not sharing electronic data, they're not doing it in real time. They certainly have different agendas because they're part of, part of it is that they all diff belong to different industries and different corporations. And they're often competitors. So we need to think of ways in which these factors, these players can be brought together. And the supposition here is that it's all around population. Whether you look at a population that you're managing or you look at it as a market, if you try to look at it as a social justice uh, based principle, it's about human beings and the welfare of all people. Well, public health is not just to be sidelined, but they have a major part to play. And in the PCMHs, which are patient-centered medical homes, the idea is that if a governmental pay structure such as Medicare is subsidizing the health care uh, uh, services and delivery for a given population in a practice, that the better that that practice is able to take a team approach and engage many, many partners, they're going to have more effective care, they're going to be uh, centric, and they're going to be uh, efficient. And that kind of partnership is what public health and primary care need to be uh, focused on. And so this is kind of the way the current system is going in the future. So let me tell you how this plays out in terms of communities. So there's this great thing called 3450, and it was actually started by the Oxford Health Alliance. And it's a principle and a practice that can be, that can be um, generalized to many, many places in the world, including the United States. San Diego in particular is a city that's done this very nicely. But essentially, it's three behaviors contributing to four conditions, which can explain 50% or more of deaths. And this is pretty much a tried and true, kind of scientifically validated thing. And any community, anywhere, any, anywhere can take this on. They can look at the statistics in their community and figure out what's killing their people in the community, what are the four conditions, the top four that are necessarily doing it, and many, in many communities, it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, and diabetes, and what are the factors, what are some of the factors, the behavioral factors that are affecting this? And so instead of trying to attack this or this in a big way with lots and lots of complexities and money, these communities focus on trying to alter the behaviors which are at the root of th this cascade. And they've shown that when you do that effectively in a community, public health, healthcare, uh, community organizations, you can actually make a dent in this. And you can do it far more effectively than any sort of large-scale policy on a national level. But the national level gives you that 
chance to have this conversation. The other thing that for systems like Nemoris are doing are, are great because they're, they're affecting uh, kids and how, the, how they are, they're being raised in terms of their, their health habits and their food habits. So this is called a 5210 uh, initiative which is to suggest that you eat five servings of vegetables and fruits a day, spend no more than two hours in front of a screen, get one hour at least of physical activity every day and hopefully no sugary beverages. Ah, here's a little bit of a catch. Because these programs are not happening in isolation. They're happening in the context of a society that is functioning in a certain way. We have all opted to function that way. No, not bad, not good. It's just that's the way we're functioning. Well, let me suggest the next step to this. If we think for a second that we as individual people are completely autonomous and we have personal will and we have complete personal control on our personal choices about our personal spending habits, boy is somebody groggy because that is not the case. There is an entire science of advertising and marketing that ensures that that is not the case. And that's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just telling you the way it works. It turns out that corporations, large or small, shape lifestyles, folks. They shape our lifestyles. They, they shape our individual choices. They do it through a me several mechanisms. Many of them support only a segment of the population because, frankly, there's market share. And that means you go after one particular group if it's, you know, God forbid, tobacco uh, products to, uh, to you know, young kids or, uh, or whatever population that, that, that the corporations might be after, you're going you're gonna to focus on that. You're going to manufacture goods that either enhance or harm health. You're going to talk about increased portion sizes or increased makeup of certain foods or high fructose corn syrup and trans fats or you're going to talk about things that that in fact enhance health so you're going to talk about organic products that are are more along the lines of of, of things that we know uh, clearly prevent cancer and 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 help with heart disease you're going to shape people's psychological states through advertising the media did you know that the tobacco industry in in 2011 spent $3 billion on marketing and advertisement. That's $24 million a day. That's a million dollars an hour. And 80% of that expenditure went to creating discounts so that they lower the bar that people who have less money, who are part of that equation, actually can consume these products. It's a good business decision. I don't blame them for that. But I'm, telling, I'm suggesting that that business decision is in the context of a lot of other things that we as a society need to think about. There's also a social alteration and physical environments. And the way that this is done can be as subtle as going into a restaurant and not even paying attention to the wonderful Italian or French music that's going on in the background because that's been shown that you are going to more likely buy things on the menu that happen to be in sync with those associations. There is so much science behind this stuff and there's so much of an investment and there are jobs and there's and and there's and there's good things but I'm just suggesting that corporations are not an independent uh, a, a variable that do not impact our health and in fact finally guarding financial interest and ensuring a favorable business climate well my goodness you know if you look at the number of lobbyists that have gone in the last 10 to 15 years it has doubled to well over 35,000 in Washington DC and other places that represent the interest of corporations and that quite frankly after many recent laws have been uh, passed will it will in fact um, influence a lot of the th stuff that's going on including our politics. There's public relation firms, there's trade associations, there's campaign contributions, there's litigation and there's sponsorship of scientific research which is inherently going to be somewhat biased. So there's this wonderful book called Lethal But Legal. I would recommend you highly to read this book. Nicholas Freudenberg has, this is a, is a quote, a closer look reveals that many unnecessary injuries and chronic health problems are spurred by what might be dubbed the corporate consumption complex, which is a network of consumer products, companies, financial institutions, associations, and public relation firms that deliberately urges to people to buy unhealthy foods and unsafe products. 
1961, as a point of context, Dwight Eisenhower warned that the military industrial complex posed a danger to our democracy and well being. And so this similar threat is on a level of that magnitude. And there are six industries that, that uh, Freudenberg uh, looks at and assesses and unpacks. They happen to be alcohol, guns, and tobacco, as well as food industry, pharmaceutical, and automoto, auto, automobile. And, and those are representing huge corporate uh, interests uh, that clearly help us in our society at the same time that do influence health. So let's talk a little bit about the rest of this because I think that as you'll, as you'll see, uh, there's, there's, there's implications to what is going on here that even outstrip what's happening within our country. So the World Economic Forum, you can Google this, you can just go to their site. World Economic Forum every year comes out with the Global Risks uh, Edition. And what they do is, it's fascinating, they take a thousand experts from industry, government, academia, all kinds of, uh, of, of, of technology and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, disciplines of, of human society. And they ask these hundred, a thousand experts, they ask them two questions. They ask them, in the next 10 years, based on everything you know, what are the things that are likely to, to be really bad that are going to happen? that you think are going to happen. Look in your crystal balls from your vantage point and tell us what bad things are going to happen. And then, to be a little bit more morbid, tell us if those bad things happen, how bad is it going to be? So they give them this questionnaire. It's a one to zero to five score. And this is what they come up with. These are, this is just from 2.5 on the abscissan ordinate, okay? 2.5 to 5 this way and 2.5 to 5 that way. And this means, obviously, right, that it's more likely to happen than not, and if it happens, it's more likely to be bad than not. Now, this is a ophthalmology wall chart. You're not supposed to read this, okay? I'm trying to suggest that there's a bunch of stuff in the right upper quadrant. But let's go delve deeper into this. It turns out that if you just look at the 60% mark, you see that in fact there are a number of things that directly or indirectly related to human health. These are global risks that are going to affect human health, all right? Things like mismanagement of population aging, fi um, uh, unstable population growth, uh, fiscal imbalances and income disparities, you know, migration and ra rising rates of chronic disease. And these are just arbitrary circles that I drew very quickly based on what I saw there. But that's not what fascinated me. What fascinated me was this. How many of these things are actually directly or indirectly related to climate change and human health? That's a whole nother discussion. And in fact, if you start uh, unpacking this, you, re you start realizing how much of these other and, you know, conditions, food shortages and water crises and, and to, to some extent land and waterway, you know, mismanagement, antibiotic resistance, you know, depletion of our, uh, our, our species and supplies. And those are affected directly and indirectly by climate change. So when the Lancet, a prestigious medical journal about five years ago, suggested that the number one, the number one public health crisis of the 21st century is going to be climate change and its impact pervasively through all sectors of human society and all aspects of human civilization and endeavor, including health, but governance, civil strife, you name it, preparedness and resilience of communities, that's where it's gonna come together. And climate change has its drivers. And this is not a talk on climate change, but I would sub submit to you that there's some more to it than, than this. And here's, here, here's what's happening. There is something called a relational epidemiology, which is the, the epidemiology of human diseases as it relates to climate change. And this is a wonderful model that, um, that Gary Egger has put together in a recent um, article, Advances in Preventive Medicine. And he suggests that there are drivers like urbanization and population growth and economic pressures. And as you get societies to doing better and better, you have an increased number of middle class and there's more consuming. That's what drives economies is, is consumerism. And so that's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, it's the fact. Well, consumerism 
in many, many parts of the world is controlled by corporations and their agendas. So it turns out that this puzzle piece is coming together because it, ter it, it means that the factors here that are driving this are going to be distal, but they are actually driving both chronic disease through these mechanisms, energy use, overconsumption, our lifestyle choices. This is just an example of inactivity, overnutrition, obesity as a, as, a, as, a, as a factor that develops. And something that we know mechanistically um, called meta-inflammation. And it's not, a, it's, not, it's, not an, it's not a coincidence that people who happen to be overweight and are obese also happen to be at risk for diabetes and metabolic syndrome and hypercholesterolemia and etc. because it's a general inflama inflammatory state that's going on in their body. Well, that inflammation is also resulting in those many of those 10 things that are driving our population health outcomes. You know, that cartoon I showed you. It's, it's connected to our disabilities. It's connected to our heart disease. It's connected to Alzheimer's. It's connected to a lot of things that are affecting our health. So inflammation is what's driving this, and it's connected in many, many indirect ways to climate change and other factors that were involved with corporations and the way they're determining our lifestyle. The other part of this is a little scarier than that, which is that it, by energy use, overproduction, there's industrial waste, there's pollution, there's something called eco-inflammation going on. Literally, global warming, as I explained to my five-year-old, you know, he asked me, what's global warming? He's curious, you know, he sees me doing stuff and, and we try to be, uh, you know, careful about how we live our lives and, and try to practice what we preach. Um, I tell him that, well, it's not good when we have a fever, right? When you have a fever, it's bad. You, you get sick. Well, the earth has a fever. <laughs> and it's not, it's, not in, it's not too out of the uh, line to say that there is a sort of infl inflammation going on because the CO2 levels in the global warming, which is well worked out in science, there's absolutely no controversy about this now, um, that those mechanisms are actually leading to ecologic pathologies, which I want to put before you as to what the implications of that are in a minute. And that has to do with emerging infections. So the selected emerging diseases in the last 40 some odd years, 30 to 40 years, are listed here for you. And many of those colleagues that I have at CDC and, and, um, and people who um, have been in uh, programs such as the Epidemic Intelligence Service. I happen to, uh, you know, have really the, the pleasure professionally of, of being part of the EIS program, um, which if you don't know is, is the signature program that was in Contagion. How many, how many of you saw the movie Contagion? So um, not a great advertisement for EIS because they kill off Kate Winslet, but, um, but, but it's a great program. But EIS has, for example, been at the forefront of a lot of these diseases, as is happening right now in terms of Ebola. And 60 to 70 percent of these conditions are what we would call newly emerging or re-emerging, and they are zoonotic infections. They are diseases that are crossing over from the animal to the human population. Hence the need for having a kind of one health model that the veterinarians uh, are, are suggesting that is, that's very important for us. Well, it turns out that if you look at outbreaks and epidemics by drivers, about a third can be described as breaches of immunization coverage, which is really a travesty because these are preventable diseases. But lack of immunization in populations drives some of this, measles, for example, in the United States sanitation and hygiene breaches, and vector control. So that's about a third. But look at this, folks. Two-thirds of the drivers are, are related to things like breakdown of public health measures, um, food and agriculture industry changes, climate and weather, international travel and commerce, and a whole host of other things, including civil conflict and military warfare and all the rest of it. And, so, and, 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 and suffice it to say that even a whopping 12% is attributed to bushmeat, which is the con con consumption of, of uh, chimpanzee meat, which as a risk factor is as related to HIV entering the human population as Ebola is. So it turns out that when we look at outbreaks, there's a wonderful monograph called Outbreaks Protecting Americans from Infectious Diseases published last year by the Trust for America's Health 
This is fascinating. They took a fairly rigorous approach in terms of looking at states and where they fall in the kind of preparedness and capacity realm. And it turns out that they gave them scores. And one can debate the scoring methodology, absolutely, but there are trends that are, that are made at manifest. And it, it turns out that when I looked at this particular graphic, I found that Florida is kind of somewhere in the middle. You know, we, we're kind of there. We, we, we certainly could be, you know, d doing a little bit better. Uh, we, we, we could, but uh, we're in this, uh, you know, kind of the median group here. But it turns out that this Ebola epidemic is connected to general preparedness. And if you look at what the implications are, for example, in Florida, just to put it out there, um, unfortunately, we've had a drop in public health funding in many areas, including vector control, in terms of being able to uh, have the kind of systems that we had in place even 10 to 15, 20 years ago, the control of mosquito populations, it's very, very important. And when public health in general is not funded well, not only are we reversing the kind of trend towards the statistic I shared with you with that article of the year in California, but we are influencing the public health environmental factors that are going to be part of that general equation of population health. So public health is critical, and those of us in public health who know that we're trying to do more and more with less and less, that's a problem. There's going to be 50,000 healthcare, I mean, public health workers who, that we are losing over the last several years and, and years to come because of retirement and other things. So let's unpack Ebola a little bit. This is a fantastic article, short article, but it talks about the outbreak, and really it's not an outbreak, it's an epidemic. So I'm, I'm a stickler with terms. This is not an Ebola outbreak anymore. It's not confined to a little region or a hospital. This is big. <laughs> this is way bigger. It, it's, it, it's an epidemic. And this epidemic in Guinea, for example, is where ecology meets economy. Two, right, of the E triangle. But the epidemiology is in, in built into this. And so Dan Bausch is one of the world fa I mean, famous, famous special pathogens people worked at CDC in the past and is, a, is an expert, a world expert in, in, in Ebola. Um, he, he uses the term de-develop, because when he went to these regions of the world over the last 10 years, sadly, every year that he went, the countries and the infrastructures were getting worse than the year before. They weren't developing, they were de-developing. So it was this kind of backdrop in which the Ebola outbreak and it started and then it fueled uh, to a level of the um, uh, epidemic uh, level. And so you see uh, scenes of degraded infrastructure in the forest regions. So there's deforestation, people who are poor and are, 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 are subsisting on various uh, uh, products that are, that are related to these forests are having to migrate. When they migrate, guess what? Other things migrate. Bats migrate. Bats migrate, they travel long distances. Why would Ebola, as a, as a as disease that was localized to Central Africa for all these decades, now move into West Africa? And that's part of the equation that's, that's happening here. Uh, deterioration of road conditions, deterioration of, of uh, uh, public health infrastructure, and on and on. And of course, the Ebola early warning signs, we might think of it as an international level, but guess what, folks? Surveillance, which is the systematic collection of data to be able to inform policy, it's the bedrock of, of, of uh, epidemiology, if you will, um, it happens at the community level. And we need to have better surveillance systems both in the wildlife habitat part and the human modified environment. Because it's this type of thing that involves the anthropological perspective, right? That, because we're talking about cultures and people that are going to drive what's happening at the national level and ultimately at the international level. This week is Get Smart Week for antibiotics. So actually today, those of you Twitter, I don't remember the hashtag, but those of you Twitter, um, at 3 o'clock, the CDC is going to have an antibiotic Twitter session. So if you guys have, you know, you want to tweet questions or, or, you know, listen in on that or whatever, um, you know, 
uh, that's something that you can you can do. Um, but but this this slide I put up here because this th there are many resources here. One of which is to suggest that you know we have millions of drug resistant infections. We have deaths, unfortunately, twenty three thousand plus that happen on a yearly basis uh, due to antibiotic resistant organisms, and 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 uh, it's a real problem. And and. How did we get here? Is a is a that's a lecture or an hour long discussion just to scratch the surface in and of itself. But the factors are very similar to the E the triple E model. There are drivers in terms of how pharmaceutical companies uh, uh, market and invest, especially to the public. And in fact, you you've seen a steep increase in the number of of public consumption of medications because there's now direct consumer marketing, which was never there for years. But that's, that's done. Then there's the economic aspects of, of how those industries are regulated or not regulated in the right way, and how research is linked with that, how phase four trials can sometimes unearth uh, toxicities like in Vioxx and other drugs that, um, that we know happened you know, after the fact, and, 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 and so there's that. And then, of course, there's the epidemiology of who's needing drugs, and why do cultural practices drive those kinds of things. So those are all really important factors. Examples of how antibiotic resistance is spread, well, here's a schematic, but suffice it to say that there are animal sources of antibiotics and gut you know, resistant organisms in our human bi microbiomes, and all of these things are part of a, of a, of a, a very intricate uh, order. And I'm not going to get into this, but we clearly know that antibiotic resistance genes transfer horizontally and vertically. And foodborne infections, just to put it out there, you know, you have a huge percentage of foodborne infections that are happening in this country related to food safety uh, across a, a range of pathogens. Some are trending down, some are trending up. We clearly know that the attribution of certain foods is, is now spelled out over a decade, 1998 to 2008. We knew, for example, that leafy vegetables and produce took the number one spot in terms of causing illness, just pure and simple illness, whereas dairy products cause more hospitalizations and poultry cause more deaths than all of the other types of things. And so we have attribution data as well. And that's what's being shown here. So the th last few minutes I want to spend on the inspirational piece. And it always seems impossible until it's done, as according to Nelson Mandela. So what can we all do? I would suggest, this is kind of just my laundry list of things that we tend to follow, but maybe some of them resonate with you. Leave your comfort zone and ask questions. You know, become more interested in population health issues and increase your awareness about the issues. I'm trying to do that a little bit today and hopefully you'll be inspired to learn more about all the sides of an issue. Engage other people, experts or non-experts, and start conversations. And constantly refer to unbiased web resources. There's so many of them out there. And read, study, and stay ready to be challenged. But the most important thing here is to think about what we can do at the community level. And those of you who are studying epidemiology and perhaps going to use it in your future careers, think about community health epidemiology. Com think about the health needs assessments and health impact assessments that are derived from epi. Think about health improvement projects that are derived from the practices and principles of epi. Learn about community engagement, mobilization, and advocacy. And then learn about community-based adaptation to climate change that's also a very important part. So learn about you know, the MAP exercise, your community roadmap to health, and, and, and trying to understand about um, uh, assessments and planning that goes on. And look at all the different ways in which you can get together with your public health department to, to move things forward. There are some great sites that you can go to. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a terrific site. It actually allows you to see any county in the country where it's going relative to its, its uh, comparable um, uh, counterparts. There's a great website called Community Toolbox, and I don't have any stock or endorsement in any of these things. I'm just telling you these are public domain sites that are fantastic. And this is like an, a Pacific Ocean of different things that you can actually do. If you don't know how to do certain things, linking Epi with community health, uh, go there and, and it'll show you how to do it. 
And then, of course, the what you can do when it comes to climate change. Literally that title, what you can do. And the EPA has this fantastic site about things that you can do at home, on the road, at the office, and make a difference for yourself and your family and your community. So um, I'm going to stop there. I've, I, I didn't leave a lot of time for questions, but I wanted to, wanted to uh, offer you these uh, words to kind of describe uh, what I think at least are, are some important issues um, and, and uh, again, inform you, uh, invite you, and inspire you. Thank you very much. For those of you who are not going to be running to a next class, I'll be up here for a while and I won't run away. I don't have another class to attend, so. <laughs> I attended a few classes. So. Right, right. Yeah. Questions, comments, disagreements, hecklers. <laughs> this is your chance, guys. <coughs> don't be shy. Yeah, please. Increase in public health. You talked about uh, how do you see the government agencies really working together because a lot of them are very narrow in their field. Are they starting to blend and really kind of dip into each other's services? Yeah, it's a great question. The question has to do with how government siloed organizations are, are working together. And yes, uh, at CDC, for example, we're working in um, with HRSA and as one example of things that I'm actually doing uh, as part of my day job. Um, you know, there are, there's so much cross collaboration going on, especially when it comes to even the Ebola and the national health response that we're having, international responses. Those are kind of given, but we're doing that on in many fronts. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. There's a lot more collaboration that we can do. Part of the structure, as you can well imagine, has to do with how things are funded. Because if there's comp competition inherently built into funding streams, it's a disincentive for people to work together. But at the same time, I see collaboration occurring horizontally and vertically. And more importantly, I see it w w uh, with the non-governmental sector, which is really where we're having to go with this. So I'm, I'm in workforce development. I train residents and, and physicians and, and medical students and, and other uh, disciplines you know, for careers in public health and health care. And uh, we, we try to, to, to engage them. So I think it is happening, but there's room for improvement. Thank you.